I am accustomed to at the highest addressing three judges at a time. But so many judges, uh, there is something which is an opportunity which have come to my life for the first time. So I take you leave to address you as my lord. Because after all, I am still a student of law. Now, <clears throat> the topic today here is defamation. But uh, before I start, I would just like to have some idea from you as to how many cases on uh, pursuing the 499-500 IPC rule uh, they do. Now, before I start, you see, thing is, this concept of defamation is uh, given birth by something which we call reputation. Now, reputation is not being defined anywhere expressly. Various jurists, various authors, various judges have tried to determine or define reputation in their own way. But I find, after making my research, I find that definition of lake is being equated with right to life under the constitution of India. And now, Supreme Court has started giving of late some shape to this word called reputation. So, before I start on defamation, we need to understand how is the courts today looking at the concept of reputation of a human being. Now, if I can just share the screen with you. Uh, if you could just bring up, sir, this judgment of the Supreme Court. Just. In uh, the case of Kishore, Samurai versus State of Uttar Pradesh and others. It would be 2013, Volume 2, Supreme Court Cases, page 398. Because this makes... the screen. Yes. Now if you if you if you just give me one moment sorry I just just give me one more moment. You see in this is a case under heaviest corpus under the constitution of India. What had happened is, you need not bother to go through the materials because I will give you the brief. What had happened here is, in the name of one of the MLAs, a complaint was lodged against a very high government official saying that he was indulging in taking bribes. This, com this complaint was lodged along with a lot of materials and which was forwarded to the deputy, uh, the deputy general of police for the purpose of making an investigation into the question of fraud. Now, this was passed on through appropriate channel to the highest authorities <coughs> and thereafter, a investigation was directed to be made. In that direction, when this investigation went, some people were roped in. One of the persons who was arrested was the person who had obtained certified copies of those documents from the registry and other places and placed it with the uh, government along with the complaint. In the first turn when it came, 
he did not name a person called Umesh. But in custody, while he was being examined, he came up with a gentleman's name called Umesh and he was also roped in in the investigation and he was arrested. A 482 was filed and in that, the question arose as to whether this man, without there being any ex express charges against him, could be trolled in the media for the purpose of his name getting involved in this. And there, the Supreme Court had used these words to define reputation. If you come to the term person includes not only the physical body, can you get it? No, just after the headlines, you come. Hand. No, it would be just after the. Don't go to the judgment, come to the. If you go to the judgment, it will be paragraphs 58 and 59. Or oh, you have this form. Could you come to paragraphs 58 59 straight away? All right, I'll leave it instead of forgetting. The term person includes not only the physical body and members, but also every bodily sense and personal attribute, which is the reputation the man has acquired. Reputation can also be defined to be a good reputation, as a good name, the credit, honor or character which is derived from favorable public opinion, or esteem and character by report. The right to enjoyment of a good reputation is a valuable privilege of an ancient origin and necessary to human society. Reputation is an element of personal security and is protected by constitution equally with the right to enjoyment of life, liberty and property. This is where the Supreme Court, I was trying to say, is now equating reputation with the right which we have guaranteed under the Constitution, which is the rights, they say, is right to liberty, life and property. Then, there is a very important distinction made between reputation and character. This I say so because when I come to the portion of uh, how to assess whether uh, the question of damages, this would be very important. Although character and reputation are often used synonymously, but these terms are distinguished. Character is what a man is, and reputation is what he is supposed to be in what people say he is. So this is where the crux of your defamation will lie. A character is what he is, reputation is what we believe he is. So, character depends on attributes possessed and reputation on attributes which other believe one to possess. The former signifies reality and the latter merely what is expected to be reality at present. The methodology adopted by the next friends in the red petitions before the High Court are opposed to political values and administration of justice. When there is material to show that the petition stands, then it's not very important. But what I was trying to impress upon you is the basis of defamation is reputation. Now, Reputation of a man is not what he thinks of himself, but what the, how others assess. How others assess. 
by trying to say how others assess it, the next question that will come, whom do you mean by others? There are people who are very eccentric in society, who on a drop of a hat say, oh, this thing has happened. My God, he's such a bad man. There are others who are so laxed and relaxed, they may say, so what? These things keep on happening. So this has happened. So all through, from the day the law of defamation had come in thoughts till date, the definition is the reputation in the reasonable thinking persons of the society. A person who is not so lax, a person who is not so hyper, but a knowledgeable man would think about me is what my reputation is. For example, uh, if you say, and I'm saying this example, if you say this gentleman who is addressing us today is not a person who has the quality to address us. For example, you say that. Question is, is it defamation? Why not? It's the perception. Right. It's your perception. Number one. Number two is, you have a right of opinion. And in your opinion, you are well within your bounds to say that according to me, this man does not have the qualities to address this world. But, tomorrow, if you write an article on this and circulate it in the internet and people who know me in Calcutta read it, then that might become a defamation and will become a defamation. So, that's the reason so nice of you. Thank you. You are sharing this. Uh, can you share it from my tab? Then it's all marked. Anyway, think, uh, relax. I, I, I think I'll, I'll, it's better to go on interactive session. So, uh, coming back to where I was, that brings us to the next facet of defamation. That is publication. Publication, I will come in details, I am just giving the outlines. Publication has various forums today. If you send me an SMS, that is a publication, if I post it. Very often we receive WhatsApp today saying forwarded many times. That means that is in circulation. That can be defamatory, that sometimes are defamatory. So publication has two modes now in this today's world. One is publication by newspapers, print material, print media, where we, to read it and understand and form our opinion. The difficulty with print media is, it's, suppose it's a newspaper, it has very limited circulation. So it's restricted within a particular zone. If it's on the internet, then anywhere in the world, people can read it. So the spread is fast, the defamation is faster. So publication is necessary for the purpose of constituting a defamation because it is they who read it and they who understand or try and read it in a manner that defames me and brings down my reputation or my right to reputation is what causes for defamation. The other two important instruments or other two important lens are intention. Now intention in civil law may or may not be very relevant. You may today say something which you may not intend to hurt somebody but you have said it. If you have said it and that actually damages the right to reputation of any particular person, whether you intend it or not, in civil law, law will presume that there has been a damage. 
unless you come within the well known defenses of justification, fair comment, absolute privilege, or the other defenses that you have in a case of reformation. In civil law, the law presumes that there has been a wrong. So far as criminal law is concerned, 499-500, you have to come within the four corners of that section to make out a case of defamation. Now, therefore I say, when we decide on the question of defamation from the civil angle, the authorities you will find is if the court is satisfied prima facie on three things, that it is intended to the plaintiff, it is intended to cause harm to the plaintiff, and it has damaged his reputation. That's the end of the plaintiff's onus. He has discharged his burden and the ownership of the defendant. Thereafter comes the concept of quantification, which I come in. So, basically, if I may borrow the words of Oxford English Dictionary, defamation has been defined. As you are all aware that defamation, there is no law of defamation defined. We don't have a civil law in India saying what is defamation, we have a criminal law. So that's the reason. So far as civil aspect of defamation is concerned, we keep on falling back on the law of torts which has this concept in English law. And uh, from there we have borrowed it till such time we had our constitution where defamation was recognized and now the wireless of section 499 500 which has been challenged very many times before the Supreme Court has been upheld now. And that, that portion will come when we come to that. So Oxford Dictionary says the offense of bringing a person into undeserved disrepute by making false statements, whether written or spoken, is defamation. So we have three very important words here. It's an offense committed against a person who doesn't deserve that disrepute, but has been made, which I say is, is directed against the plaintiff and is defamatory in civil law. And the allegation and accusation has to be false. Because the other side of the coin is justification. Which is a complete defense to defamation. When I come to the defenses, I come to that. Justification in short means, as you are all, all aware, my loves, that what I say, I stand by it. And if I can prove what I have said is correct, then no matter how much I defame it, there would be no damages in civil law. So this is how Oxford has defined defamation as an offence, bringing a person into undeserved disrepute by making false statements, whether written or spoken. And Black says, the act of harming the reputation of another by making a false statement to a third person, which means you are harming somebody with or without intention. You are harming his reputation, which is an actionable wrong. The statement which you are making is false. That's the third requirement. And the fourth is, you are doing so with a third person. Now, while I was reading this, it occurred to me that what happens when a lawyer drafts a notice, we very often write, suppose you, sir, today if you are dictating a letter to your stenographer, who is a person who is dictating, he is a third person. You are saying something against somebody in his presence, although within the four corners of your chambers. Are you defaming that man? And does he have a cause of action against to defame you? The answer is no. Why? Because the stenographer is doing his duty and he is not supposed to understand or to publish that words. Seven except, take down notes and bring it back to you. 
But suppose I write a letter to you defaming. I send a letter to you in a sealed cover. You open it, you read it. And it does contain defamatory meaning. Is it defamation? The answer is no. Because there has been no publication. But if I write a letter to you in an open envelope and that letter before reaching you reaches your registry and the man who is there in the registry takes out the letter and reads it and shares it with his colleagues before passing it on to you. Question is, is it defamation? In civil law, yes. Because the intention was not. The, my intention was to send it to you. But I have kept it open, leaving an angle that somebody may take it out and read it. I run that risk. If I run that risk, and if that happens, then you get a right to defend. You can write to say. That's why when we write plates on defamation, we say that you have circulated, you have sent this letter. When it is by way of a defamation, we say, you sent this letter which was read by my secretary in the presence of all my staff and all my staff came to know from your innuendos that you were trying to defend me. That is one of the very common pleadings we have in the civil suit of defamation. Because publication is something which I have to prove along with intention. So, uh, so far as defamation civil is concerned, uh, at the cost of reputation I must say, it's injuring a person Lowering him in his estimation of others. Intention to ridicule, may be there, may not be there. Injuring someone to his or her trade or calling. This is something which uh, we need to understand. If a colleague of mine says that Mr. Dart is an awfully bad lawyer. I have seen him arguing over years. He doesn't make any sense in court. I don't know how does he do the profession. I would like to ask any one of you, can you say whether it is defamation or not? Uh, if we apply the four tests, that I have just now said, that would be what would determine whether it is defamation or not. Are the words defam does it injure my reputation? My reputation as a lawyer is deserving the clients to whom I do service. As a colleague in the same profession, he has a right to hold an opinion against me. If he is discussing this, Sitting in a table where other members of the bar are sitting, it makes no difference. They may also say the same thing, they may differ. Very often we do that. Very often we sit across the table, we discuss person, which we call in law gossip. We do gossip about people. We do express opinions, but they are not defamatory. But if he says so to any of my clients or any of a group of my clients, and the people who are receiving it have reason to believe that any portion of it is correct or not correct. It's immaterial. So far as I am concerned, the damage has taken place. Whether those clients believe it or not is immaterial. Whether they come back to me or they leave me or they leave somebody else is immaterial, but the damage has happened. So there it becomes actionable. So the reason why I am giving these examples are is when it comes to a court of law, my lords, you would be faced with the situation where you will have to take a call as to whether a defamation has at all taken place. And these things won't come out from the plate or the written statement. This will come out from circumstantial evidence. So if a person comes, if a plaintiff comes and says, well, look, this is a letter written or this was the statement made in court, is his statement won't do. It, he has to corroborate it. And the person who will corroborate it, if he is that lawyer or if he is a friend, 
who is in the same trade and calling, that may not be defamation. But if some member of the public, whom he, to whom he is known as a reputed lawyer, comes and says, yes, I, was also, I have also come across this statement, it was made, and I felt bad. Then the first limb of defamation is proved. Once that is proved, damage is presumed. Thereafter, the other things will come, whether it was purposely done, whether it was done without any intent, those things will come subsequently, which you will have to uh, decide based on the evidence led by the plaintiff, because it's the plaintiff's owners to discharge that first before it comes to the defendant to take up all us to his defense. So, injuring someone in his or her trader calling can be defamatory, cannot be defamatory depending on the evidence before you. And the ultimate thing, I repeat, in effect, diminishing the good opinion the others may have of the man in his estimation, in the estimation of the third person. Now, let us now go into the forms of defamation. As you all know, my lords, defamation can be spoken or it can be in writing. So the two basic differences are libel and slander. If you look, look at the book of torts, or if you look up the English law, libel, which is defamation in writing, is per se actionable. But under the English law, slander is not actionable unless you can prove special damage. If I, under the English law, special damages means damages which have to be proved by the plaintiff to the hilt to get a degree. Whereas in libel, as I said, in civil law, it's presumed once you can establish, once the plaintiff can establish that defamation has taken place. And it was intended, the words were defamatory, it was intended to him, and it has been published, or his reputation is tarnished. Law will presume that damages have taken place. So this is the difference between libel and slander so far as English law is concerned, and Indian law is concerned. So far as Indian law is concerned, it does not make any difference between libel and slander. In both the cases, Damages can, does accrue, do accrue, and are payable. So, there we make a distinction when we discuss about the law of defamation and tort. Here in India, we don't have this distinction, like English law. Now, libel can be of various forms. It can be what's about. It can be gestures, it can also be by movement of hands and fingers. I am coming to that, probably she is trying to say that uh, gestures may not fall within the definition of libel, probably that is why she was looking at me. Uh, if I say to you something in black and white or spoken that is words of mouth now words of mouth so long it remains oral is slander very often we come across newspapers where it says quote so and so has said this. The person who has issued these words of mouth to somebody may be a slander so far as he is concerned. 
but the reporter who publishes it transforms it from a slander to like. Now, once this gets transferred, this gentleman may say, well, I did not intend to publish it. I did say it in public, but I do not intend to publish it. So, catch hold of that gentleman who had reported. He is the one who has published it. But what has he published? He has published something which you have spoken. So, that is the reason why it is said that a man who says, and a man who publishes defamatory statements do so on their own peril. So, what's about per se is not is not actionable in England, but is in India. Gestures, winking, smiling. With an intention, uh, with uh, if I if I give some obscene gestures to somebody, that will come within the definition of slander because there is nothing writing. But that is actionable, provided you can prove it. And movements of hands and figures is something which uh, I have yet to come across. We have very often seen deaf and dumb people, they exchange words by hands and fingers. They can also convey defamatory words. So, so long it remains in that form, it may be defamatory but can't be proved. But once it is published or once it is written, and once it is established by evidence. So far as gestures is concerned, to be very candid, <coughs> I tried to look up the law. There is only one case in England which I could find, and that too of 1908, where some gentleman made some gesture in a unique way, and that was held to be defamatory. In that case, what had happened in England, if you light up a light in front of a house, a candle in front of a house during the day and it is there throughout its body, the indication was in Sussex that it was a whole house. So to defame somebody, a gentleman put up, he had a fight, he put up a candle on the doorstep of somebody and left it there. And a case was lodged against him saying that this was done for the purpose of defaming that gentleman and his family because that candle which is being lit in front of the door from morning till evening was indicating something else which the people of the society understood it to be. That was the indication in those days. And damages were offered. There was proof this gentleman had come to the box, he had given his evidence, and the courts ultimately awarded damages for that. But apart from that, although I did find references of uh, there being slander by way of deaf and dumb persons exchanging, but I couldn't find any case law on this as of now. If I come, I will definitely resume. So these are slander, which, as I repeat, is not actionable so far as England is concerned unless you can prove special damages and India they are per se actionable and suits can be filed. So far as libel is concerned is the one defamation which all of us come across. They can be in various forms, they can be in writing, they can be printing, they can be drawing, they can be statues, they can be effigies, they can be any form apart from spoken words. Now, slander can become libel, as I said. I have spoken something, somebody has published it, it has become libel. And at the same time, uh, if you do publish something without an intention of harming anybody, I repeat, so far as civil law is concerned, is of no consequence. 
Now, while I was working on this, a very important topic came up. My junior asked me, Sir, if I draw the chief minister's photograph, I am an artist. I draw the photograph of a chief minister in the form of a hen. I am an artist. I have a right to express myself. If I am express myself, that is my opinion of the chief minister. Am I causing any light? Now the answer to that is yes and no both. Very recently, a case had come across the Supreme Court and Justice Deepak Mishra is the judge who had been dealing with all these defamation cases where somebody wrote a few lines about Mark Gandhi and a case was lodged against him before the Supreme Court that he has defamed a historic figure and there the court had the occasion to decide on what is the right of a poet what is the right of an author or what is the right of a creative person do they have the right to frame their opinions in a manner which they think because they are creative persons? Now, I will, I, I will cite that judgment for the purpose of you all because I found that that was a very interesting development in law that has taken place in that. Apropos my junior's query, well, if you can draw a picture, you can draw a picture definitely. If you put it up in your bathroom or bedroom to which others don't have access, no problem. But if you put it up in a drawing room or in your chamber and every client visiting it sees it, then also is not a problem so long the chief minister doesn't come to know of it. But if the chief minister comes to know of it, then next day you are in jail. Irrespective of whether defamation has taken place or not. But yes, thing is, you as an artist, you have a right to express yourself. That expression may or may not cause uh, damage to somebody's reputation. But as I said, the moment you publish it, you do so at your own risk. So therefore, in those cases uh, where uh, publication takes place, meaning thereby that what was the libelous or defamatory statement get the occasion to be shared by people. Again, we are coming back to that same thing. If it is shared by people, then somebody's right or right to reputation is on a stage to be decided. People may go against it, people may go in favor of it. But that man whose name is being trolled gets a right of defamation straight away. By repeatedly saying that that's a right to defamation, I mean that he has a right to claim damages from the person who has defamed him. Uh, do I need to go more on this defamation or do I need to proceed? Now, let me give me some, some more instances of defamation. Suppose, there can be libel by allegory. Libel by allegory is very common. I am sure all of you have read books where sometimes some portion of the books resemble some portion of your life. Or maybe you take up a book which exactly fits into what has happened to you in your life. Now the question is, was it meant for you? Or did the author write something which accidentally fits into your life. Now, I have not yet said whether it's good or bad, but these situations do happen. Now, if ordinary facts of a story relating to somebody who may not be known to the author, in such cases, the plaintiff has to prove that the facts were relating to him and the people who know him has associated the defamatory articles to him. 
These are the words I repeat from the judgment. It says, if you are, suppose, you read that book and you feel that, well, it was intended to defend, and you go to court. Now, what is your burden? What, as a plaintiff, what do you have to show? You will have to show, in cases of libel by allegory, that the plaintiff has to prove that the facts were relating to him, one. Second, that the people who know him have associated such facts to him. So meaning thereby that those people have also read that article or that book, also know you, and they have able, been able to associate or think or in common words we say, have been able to sync this fact in the book with you. Now, if you just go to the background, you will find as a judge, now you are looking at very many people coming and giving evidence to you in a simple way. So you have the person who has come and complete. You have to get hold of the person who knows the plaintiff and knows the fact, has read the book and has been able to sing and has come to an opinion or and has come to a finding or conclusion that the image of the plaintiff has been damaged. So these are the five issues which will automatically crop up in case of libel by allegory. And the third requirement is, have associated the defamatory article to that man in such a manner that it has demeaned him or caused harm to him. This is so far as the plaintiff side of the story is concerned in libel by allegory. Then the author comes. The first defense of the author would be a I don't know the plaintiff at all. So there is no reason for me to defend. But as I said, if it is a civil action, intention is not material. Whether you have done it or not, is not material. With, whether we have done it with malice or intention is not material. If these things have proved by the plaintiff, whether the author comes and says, I never even have seen this man in life, is not material. And the second thing is, if he knows, if he knows the plaintiff, and he says that, well, I have written this, keeping his story in mind, but never intended to be uh, used in a manner so as to defame him then also it is not material in civil law. Because as I repeat myself, that in defamation, once you prove these three or four uh, ingredients, law presumes that damage has already taken place. Unlike criminal law. So, in English law, you will find there is a third defense available, which is not available in Indian law is apology. In contempt jurisdiction, that's one of the differences available in law, where we come before the court and we tender our unqualified apology. But in law of defamation, in Indian law, there is no concept of apology. Because apology will not restore the reputation which the man has lost. In contempt jurisdiction, by saying apology, the judge is releasing you under his powers under Article 215 of the Constitution of India from being jailed or being proceeded against you in contempt. But, having said so, he has all the powers under that same article to undo what has been done wrongfully. 
That's why we very often say that you can't go on enjoying the fruits of contempt. Similarly, although we have this concept of apology in Indian law so far as contempt jurisdiction is concerned, but in defamation, we don't have this concept. So apology is a defense in English law, but not in Indian law. The other mode of definition can be... Sir? Yes, please. Uh, sure. So the example that you shared, so in case in that book, the author has given a disclaimer, it's a work of fiction. I'm coming to that. Okay. I'm coming to that. I, I, I am aware of it. Anyway, since you have, since you have uh, already raised the topic, uh, let me put it this way. Just a bit. We very often come across cases, or, or we, now that's, that's generally what happens is, whenever we see a movie, or whenever we see a, whatever we watch, the first lines of disclaimer are, the picture which you are going to see, the words which you are going to hear, was not intended to be harm any person or his reputation. This disclaimer will not, if I may say so, will not prevent the person making that statement from liable to be, uh, for being liable for damages if the plaintiff can prove that it was intended to defame him, that defamation was not honest, that statement or, uh, of uh, disclaimer was not honest and that it has injured his reputation. There is no such law in India which will prevent you. It is generally said so that uh, uh, people don't associate themselves with it or you are put on guard that no. But as I said, that I mean I may or I may not associate myself with that fact. But if this lady over here, my lord, if she knows me and if she thinks, well, this is a fact which is directly relatable to Shumon. And yes, Shumon did something very wrong. This, I, I agree with the author of the film. What he has projected, Shumon, is not proper. He should not have done it. Then that's defamation. Irrespective of the fact whether you put that disclaimer. Because this disclaimer the, is basically what you are trying to say, well, I... If there is a tendency, there may be a chance I defame you, but I don't intend to do it. And the very first words of mine were, intention is immaterial. Intention will become material so far as criminal law is concerned, because there you will have find mens rea and motive. You have to find, but not in civil law. Uh, I was actually reading one of the articles on what the question which you have just put to me. What had happened there is, although that's an English law, uh, a man wrote a book about a person sitting in Europe. That book was published in Europe, circulated, no problem. That book was so famous, it was translated in other languages. And it so happened that somebody in China, a barrister in China, had resembled those facts, exact facts that were there in that book. Just think of the author, he had written the book in English. Probably in his wildest of dreams, he would not have come across that somebody in China, who is also a barrister, uh, that my creative uh, thinking or my creative writing would fit his lifestyle. He was sued. This Chinese lawyer had sued this gentleman, saying that whether he had intention or not is immaterial. But people in China who have read 
the translated copy of that book, associate these facts to my life. So my reputation is damaged. So at the bottom you will always find its reputation is what people think of me, not what I think of me. If there is any slightest chance that people may think otherwise than what I am, in their estimation, not in my estimation, then that's the formation. That's the simplest way of looking at it. Now the other deformation of libel, another example can be, if I make a defamatory statement, for example if I say that uh, members of a particular club are ill-behaved, is it defamatory or not? Any club, I don't want to name, make a, a defamation of any particular club in second, but I just any club. Members of a club are not properly behaved. Yes. Sir. Sorry? I think it is defamatory. Why do you think so? Because club is supposed to have a reputation and it depends on where you are making the statement also. You are absolutely right, so far as 499 is concerned. A class of persons or a corporation has a right. But in civil law, no. Because it's a general state. You, you very often say, Madam, if you, if you remember, you must be discussing with your friends that journalists nowadays tend to write rubbish. They flare up things which do not happen. Are you defending any particular journalist? You're saying, you're giving it a general speech. But if you say that the members of press club of uh, Sikkim are all dishonest and they don't uh, stick to their vows when they write, then you have brought it down from a general statement to a group of 50 people. Now these 50 people, any one of them cannot come and say, well, that, that is directed to me. So therefore, if it's a question of one person coming up and saying that, well, I take it on me that it was intended to me, then that would probably not stand in a civil law or in a civil suit that, well, this is defamatory. Because he can't prove that it was intended to be addressed to the plaintiff. That is the first requirement. It is defamatory, but it was not intended to you. But if you look at the exceptions under 499, you will find that group of persons and corporation appears there. When I come to my 499 aspect, I will discuss this. The reason is, in England, the concept of corporate law or corporate entity, having a separate individual entity, is recognized in that aspect of law, but not in defamation. Because defamation, they say that if you are a juristic person, you cannot have a reputation which can be damaged. Because you are a creation of law. But in India, all these companies, they do have a reputation. And in fact, their reputation is huge. Their marketability gets affected. Their shares get affected. Why? Because of Section 499, and India recognizes that an independent juristic person, juristic entity, also has a reputation. So there is another difference between English law and so far as our Indian law is concerned. If you look up the books of Jolovis or Summer or any of those taught writers, you will find that these statements in this association of persons are broadly discouraged uh, in actions of defamation as saying these are general statements. But if you can indicate, or, or it also depends on the nature of the statement. As I said, if you say all journalists write nowadays flare up, you are not intending to harm anybody's reputation. It's your opinion. You can share it with a friend. 
you can share it or you can even write it. That I feel that nowadays journalists are doing so much. They are writing something more than what the fact is. You don't intend to harm anybody, you are not actually singling out anybody. But therefore you are not defaming. But if you are naming somebody, that person may take up a cause of libel and defamation. So that is one another exception. So therefore, the four issues before a court of civil law is, is the article defamatory? I end by, so far a civil portion, I'll end by this. Is the article defamatory? So far libel is concerned. Does it refer to the plaintiff? Has it been published in the opinion of, so that people can have opinion on that? And has the defendant participated in that publication? This is so far as the plaintiff's side is concerned. Libel, slander, various forms and thereafter the law is there. Now there are various instances uh, you will come across the more we read, the more we come across, but these are the basic tenets. Now comes the defendant's side. Faced with, please excuse me, I have a last one. Faced with uh, a charge of defamation, the defenses that are available in civil law, one is plain denial, which we very often come, and I have not been so. It's a plain denial of a statement, that's why the plaintiff has to prove that it was intended to him, published by the defendant. That's one. Secondly, another form of denial is that the statement was made, but it was not intended to the plaintiff. So there, the second button of the plaintiff comes that it refers to the plaintiff. In the second form of defense, please note that the defendant is not denying that the statement has been made by him. But he says that I have not referred it to the plaintiff. Third is, the defendant may come and say that the statement that has been made by me is not defamatory at all. Fourth is justification which is a very, very dangerous defense to take. Because if you are pleading justification, you are owning up all the four points which the plaintiff has to prove. You are admitting that the statement is defamatory. You are admitting that it refers to the plaintiff. You are admitting that it was published and it was published by you. So justification is the most dangerous difference and generally lawyers don't advise to make justification because if you fail to prove any one of them, then the rest in the plaintiff need not prove. But having said that, if the defendant is confident and has materials before the court to show that he was justified in making that statement, then howsoever defamation may, may happen. Howsoever loss or damage to the reputation of the plaintiff may have caused, the defendant can go scot-free. So, justification is generally done in cases where people have made statements, published them, with supporting materials which are conclusive. 
it has to be conclusive. Otherwise, justification may not be a difference because all these four things you are admitting, if any one of them you fail to prove, then you are suffering a degree. That's why all the books that you come across, all the lectures that you find, they always add a word of caution. Then be very careful when you take this difference. The other is fair comment. Fair comment means, I shall elaborate when it comes to that. Fair comment means that, well, I did not intend to defame you. But I made this comment, so I want to make the members of the public aware that this thing might happen, might not happen. A few days back, an article came in the papers that some, some person in America had uh, been digging into the affairs of Adani. And the first item he published, the first article he published, was indicative of a fact that Adani was on the verge of breaking the rules of SEBI and getting routed. So that was the first indication that he gave in his article about Adani. Now we know every day in the papers Adani is selling off its shares to pay off the debts. It was an indication that this company is in very bad shape, although the, uh, the uh, shares and the situation, uh, uh, the books do not show the company in bad shape, but the company is in bad shape. That's why it is selling off its assets outside India. If this man had made this comment, and when it got the attention of the government, investigations were made, and thereafter everybody knows what is coming out in the papers every day regarding Adan. But this man had made this comment for the public good. He was trying to blow a whistle that look, investors around the world, be cautious. Because here is a company in whom people have invested their lives or crores or whatever, in whatever form. But this company, as I see from my point of view, is sliding off. So be cautious. Now had this man been called by Adani to the court of law and challenged, and if he had materials before him to show that the comment which he made was a fair estimation of his understanding of what is happening in the company, which is available in the public domain, then it's a fair comment. If it's a fair comment, then courts have not entirely washed off the, uh, the uh, defendant from paying any damages. Because there is a distinction, as I said, between justification and fair comment. By justification means you can show what I am saying is conclusive. But fair comment is his views of what it appears from the statements and records available on public domain that this company might be going down. Or is going down. Or is selling off its shares. He is making a fair comment of facts that is there. But that's not conclusive. It is his views based on records which the company has made available to the public domain. So that's fair comment. So fair comment in most of the cases is not justification. Please don't jumble up with justification. Justification is conclusive proof. Fair comment is not conclusive proof. And the other is the privileges. Privileges can be absolute, like a judicial privilege. Judicial privilege has many forms. The first and foremost is a statement made by a judge in court. 
Ce ți-a pregătit? Second is statements made by subordinate officers in course of their duty. Amongst themselves. In course of their duty. Then statements made by advocates in court on behalf of their clients against the adversary. Statements made in pleadings, affidavits, notices, summons are all privileged. You cannot pick up a lawyer's notice and sue him for damages, but you can sue him for malicious prosecution. That is another aspect. Though it's not subject matter of our discussion today, but malicious prosecution is intricately linked with reformation. And the last of the judicial, known judicial privileges is statement by witness from the box. These are what the law has classified as judicial privilege. The other form of privilege is legislative privilege. Legislative privilege extends to statements made by parliamentarians within the four corners of the parliament, not beyond that. That's a legislative privilege. We see very often in the TV what happens in Lok Sabha. Uh, and most of them are defamatory. But they have that privilege. And publications made under the parliamentary proceedings protection of Publication Act of 1956. Any publications made under that? You very often in courts, my lords, have come across uh, debates. Because before a law is passed, we have those debates in the parliament. Now these debates are all noted at the court. If you see these debates, or if you read these debates, you will find that People are openly criticizing each other. Previously, if you read the old debates, they had that amount of brotherlyhood and respect. They could say it with some amount of constraints. But today, if a party, political party, wants to espouse the law, <coughs> the other will openly go in parliament and say, this is doing for a particular community to take its votes. This is never made. But those statements, by the grace of God, are not sued, are not uh, liable, so we are not bothered with it as of now. But the question will arise is if I say these same words on a public meeting at the corner of a the street, then what happens? He is a member of the parliament. But he is not within the four corners of the parliament. So that privilege doesn't extend to him. So he is liable. But the fact remains that we say, we hear this so often that we forget to even think that well it bothers us. It doesn't bother us. The person who is at the receiving end is not bothered. The public is not bothered. But if you look at it very intricately, you will find every element of libel, slander, everything is there. Those words spoken are slanderous, they are recorded. The moment they are recorded, they get the form of a thing which can be published. And if it's published, then it becomes libel. Then there are state privileges. When well, officers of the state have this privilege, interaction between officers of state. Interaction between officers of the state. Interactions between ministers in course of their duty. It's not parliament. It's interactions between ministers in course of their duty. And interaction between government officers. These do not constitute. Or if, if somebody holds them up, they come within the... Uh, four corners of 
privilege, which is an absolute defense. And this is something which you may come across, uh, which we in law is called qualified privilege. So we have four kinds of privilege, judicial privilege, legislative privilege, state privilege, I have given the examples, and qualified privilege. Qualified privilege has nothing to do with any of these three. Qualified privilege is when, it, uh, when the statements made applies to a fit occasion. That means it's more or less based on justification. You have made a statement which fits the occasion and the judge feels that, well, the statement made was correct. Or, suppose, it was not an uncalled for statement, it was made with reference to an occasion which the people think was correct. For example, at 10.30 you come out of your car going to attend office, some political party members sit on the road and they block it. The members who get affected by that, they feel that bunch of hooligans are sitting on the road. They have nothing to do and this is what they do, they are obstructing me from going to office. And all the people who are standing in that queue, they also feel the same thing. The question is, if it is a question before a court of law, is it a fit occasion for them to obstruct the public for the purpose of drawing their attention to whatever agenda they have? And if the public has reacted to it, is it defamation? Or does he have the benefit of a qualified privilege? Suppose you go to a place where you find people fighting over whatever. Suppose something is being distributed and people are fighting over it like cats and dogs. And he said these are a bunch of animals. You have the qualified privilege. What do you think, sir? I don't think you have that right. Because then you are defeated. Because if something is being offered and if there is a rush to get to that, that's fair. It may not be in an orderly manner. You may not like it. But if you write tomorrow in the media that people were behaving like a bunch of animals, each one of them in that auditorium have a right to shoot them. So what I am trying to say is qualified privilege is something which depends on the facts of each case. And qualified privilege is something which, which I have yet to see has taken place or has been taken as a defense in it. Because qualified privilege is something which you are going within the domain of the judge. If the judge feels otherwise, you are gone. As a defendant, you are gone. So don't give him that alibi. Don't give him that discretion. Must not be malicious and improper. Those are the three conditions of qualified privilege. A. It applies when it is made in a fit occasion, not uncalled for statement, must have reference to the occasion, and must not be malicious or tainted with improper motives. So these are the three requirements of a qualified privilege.
No, thank you. A black one, yes. No, thank you. Now, so far as uh, this privilege of parliamentarians are concerned, if I may just read out loudly uh, Article 105 of our Constitution. The heading goes like this. Powers, privileges, etc. of the House of Parliament and of the members and committees thereof. Subject to the provisions of this Constitution and to the rules and standing orders Regulating the procedure of Parliament, there shall be freedom of speech in Parliament. No member of Parliament shall be liable to any proceedings in any court in respect of anything said or any vote given by him in Parliament or any committee thereof. And no person shall be so liable in respect of the publication by or under the authority of either House of the Parliament of any report, paper, vote or proceedings. I only mark the words by or under the authority of either of the House of the Parliament. It's not beyond, it doesn't extend beyond that. In other respects, the powers, privileges and immunities of each House of the Parliament and the members and the committees of each House shall be such as may be from time to time defined by the Parliament by law and until so defined shall be those of the House and its members and the committee, committee immediately before coming into force of Section 15 of the, or the Constitution's 45th Amendment Act 1978. The provisions, this is important, provisions of 1, 2 and 3 shall apply in relation to person who by virtue of this Constitution have the right to speak in and otherwise to take part in proceedings of a House of the Parliament or any committee thereof as they apply in relation to member of So this privilege is only made for persons who have a right to speak in the Parliament and otherwise a right to take part in the proceedings. It's not that somebody goes into the Parliament and say that I have said this within the four corners of the Parliament, therefore it's privilege. No. So the privilege is extended to members of the Parliament under this article and those persons who have a right to participate in that. So far as judges are concerned, you are free to say anything. And that will, of course, you shout at lawyers like us. You don't say, when we, deter, when we retaliate, you say, I don't mean you, I mean your client. But I'm sorry, you have to take it. So, now, uh, anybody has any questions on civil uh, defamation regarding the cause of action? Because I am still at the cause of action stage. Then comes the proceedings. So, I go to the proceedings. This is where probably you will be more interested as to, but any, any, any questions on cause of action as to what constitutes defamation, what not? Yes, yes, please. Could you, could you use the microphone, please? Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Sir, I was thinking about all the innuendos, fly innuendos that people pass. So, if, it, if it's in public forum and all the, uh, everything is fulfilled of the defamation, so will we, uh, will we consider those innuendos under defamation or it will come under the exceptions of the defamation? Could you please come again a little slowly? Yes. Uh, I was thinking about the innuendos, yes. side innuendos that people pass. So I was thinking if those uh, come under the defamation or we could uh, put it in the exception of fair... No, no, the innuendos are nothing. Innuendos are like when we draft a legal notice, what we say? We say by these words you meant and or intended to me. So innuendo is is an articulate way of saying something which ultimately ends in defamation. So 
if you look at the definition of innuendo, innuendo is uh, suppose I say Mr. X is a better gentleman or Mr. X presents himself properly before uh, before the women than Mr. Y. What I am trying to say is Mr. Y doesn't know how to conduct himself in the company of women. Now Mr. When y, Mr. Y will write to me, we will, because he can't say that I have said it to him. I have said it to X. So what he will say is that by using those words in your innuendos, you meant and or intended to me that I could not conduct myself because there were only two persons, X and Y. I could not conduct myself properly in the company of women. So, innuendos means uh, you will have to find out if faced with an innuendo, you will have to find out what was the intention of that man. And that you don't have to find out. That's the plaintiff has to show. Mr. Y has to come and show that that was a statement made, directed to the plaintiff. And that it was defamatory. So, so far as that burden is concerned, you leave it on the plaintiff. Question, generally question that will come is whether in, the, in, in a situation like this, whether Mr. X did it by malice or not. As I said, malice in civil law has no... Whether the statement made by Mr. X or by me in, in view, uh, concerning X and Y was published, and whether people who knew Mr. Y thought that it affected his reputation. It's just since you have, I have a piece over here. Just a minute, just, just see if I can find it quickly. By the way, if, if anybody is interested, it's just that I had reported, sir. Since I found that qualified privilege is uh, a little, uh, what should I say, a little complicated, I have jotted down four or five instances of what can be a qualified privilege. Statements made in performance of duty can be passed on as a qualified privilege. Statements made in police reports. Statements made in reports reporting a crime. Information regarding defalcation of money. So from this we get an idea that you are not, you are, <coughs> you are actually, uh, you are actually doing these three things. You are reporting a fit situation, suppose a crime has taken place. You are reporting a situ fit situation. It is your duty to report, that's why it's not uncalled for and must have reference to the occasion. And it is neither malicious nor improper. So it is in this light that you will have to judge what is a qualified privilege. Now if you, if you apply these three tests to any one of these examples, you will find, you will get an idea as to what a qualified privilege is. Suppose if I report a crime, neither am I uh, saying it in an occasion which does not fit, a man has been murdered or is bleeding, I report it. It's my duty. It's not uncalled for. And at the same time, the occasion has occurred because I see a scene of crime. 
and it is not done with any malice to any particular person. It's just that I'm doing a duty of action. These are instances of qualified privilege, not otherwise. Yes, madam, any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, sometimes, or maybe newspapers, and also in TV, we come across cartoons and all of some political person or a film star. Uh, like you said, uh, your junior had given an example that if it is made, if the chief minister is made uh, the cartoon of a hen and all. So that is, we usually come across newspapers where political figures are given different cartoon images yes. and all and for the media. Yes. So, so will that come into definition? No. And I, 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 when I come to this question, answer this question, the reason I'm not answering it now, right now is you will find if you look at old cases on Indian law, you will find that there are instances where it has been held to be defunct. But after the Information and Technology Act has come into play, there has been a wide sea change in the law of defunct. In fact, you are aware that Section 66A of the Information to and the Technology Act has been declared ultra-virus by the Constitution, by, by the Supreme Court. And there, are, there is a lot of debate on that. Because as Madam and my lords and I have come across, I, and I, I was, in fact yesterday I was talking to my lord the Chief Justice of Sikkim. And I told him that I'm grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. Because candidly speaking, when I started making my research, I found that the law has shifted from what the law of defamation was and what it is today. You will find, when I show you those authorities and the discussions of the Supreme Court, you will find that people are now tending more towards freedom of speech than defamation. But at the same time, when there was a challenge to sections 499 and 500 of the IPC to be declared as unconstitutional as violative of Article 19, which is the freedom of speech, the Supreme Court said no. 499, 500 is perfectly valid because of the law. And then the question of balancing these two had come. That is when we go to this cyber definition and all this I'll come. And that is where you will come across these instances where whether I have a right to say something which does not offend any one of those grounds under Article 19.2. Do you have the constitution with you? Since that you are on this, do you have a Can you share the constitution please? Uh, I'll read it for you. I'll read it for you. 19.2 says, 19, Article 19.1, all citizens. Can you share, can, can you share the... Constitution. Yes. Yes. Article 19, Article 19. One night. Yes. All citizens shall have the right to freedom of speech. The only and only exceptions are 19.2. You have the whole world to you, so long you don't violate 19.2. What is 19.2? Nothing in clause A of clause R, that is freedom of speech, shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law. The reason why you find these words operation of existing law is at that stage when this constitution was framed, India didn't have a law of defamation. Follow the English law. 
So that was protected there. That's why the law of torts gets applied in India. It's because of the constitution saving that portion, operation of any existing law. Or prevent the state from making any law, which it has made, Article 493. In so far as such law imposes reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right conferred by the said subclause in this is, if you offend any one of this then it's bad you should not offend the sovereignty and integrity of India the security of the state the friendly relations with foreign states public order that is something which you need to understand what is public order Decency or morality, these are these decency and morality referred to individual citizens. Decency or morality, or in relation to contempt of court, defamation comes in there, or incitement to an office. Now, the test is which I am saying is in a very simple manner, it is not that simple. The question which you put to me, a caricature of Prime Minister Modi or a cartoon picture of Prime Minister Modi, we also find it in the papers. Does it offend any one of these? If it is, then you cannot do it. If it doesn't, it comes within the freedom of speech and expression. That's the test in India. So now, madam, you must be thinking that this one and a half or two hours that I have spent telling you that it must refer to the plaintiff, it must be defamatory, it must uh, harm the reputation of some person, all these four things. They become, if not osios, at least they get diluted because of this, what I have just said. And this is the shift that has happened or is happening in India today. So the law, if you read, you will find that the law prior to 56 or even thereafter 60s and 70s, they were actually following the English pattern, talks. But now, since this right of speech has become so important that Supreme Court is now trying to rethink, it's trying to evolve. And the scope of defamation has been reduced to only that, defamation or incitement of an office. And that is where I will show when I come to that judgment, where Justice Deepak Mishra was very, very, uh, what should I say, very, very careful in showing that, well, Article 19.2 is there. You have right to say everything. But don't forget 499-500. So, so long you are not coming within the four corners of 499-500, you are safe. No defamation. But if you come within that, then the law will take its own course. So, apropos your question, when we come to that judgment, we find where, just, uh, where uh, Mahatma Gandhi was defamed. There this concept came up as to how far a man can go with his right of freedom of speech. Can he say something against the father of the nation? Will it offend any one of these? That was the test that was applied. That was a very, very important question because that gave me the bridge to cross from this section to the other section. Now, I just wrap up so far as the civil aspect is concerned. Now, can you excuse me for a minute, please? I can write for a minute, for a minute. As I was calling. was asking me regarding publication, political speeches. Yes. 
Now, if you will just hurriedly take down the broad heads which you are to consider in case of publication. Now, we are talking of publication not in the media, but in printed form, where you have an author uh, who does the editing and all. So, publication is, first thing you will have to ascertain whether the publication is mechanical and a negligent publication. Cases, this is a defense if there is defamation. That I have negligently published it or I have mechanically reproduced something without intending to do so. I read it somewhere and I thought that, well, this is something I also said the same thing. So that's basically reproduction, what we say. In neither of them would be a defense in case of defamation. But this I'm talking of civil law. Then, there is another very important thing which nowadays happens in the media you will find. You see a photograph. And you have the author's version of that photograph. Place yourself in the place of a reader. You have not seen the incident unless you see the photograph. You have also not heard of the incident unless you saw the photograph for the first time. And you have the author's version printed in the printed media saying that this is what has happened. And he makes some statements over there. This is a con suppose this he uses the he or she uses the word controversial. Idiotic. The pe question has arisen are the people or the media or, or is the publisher liable for this? And quotes are held yes. Because if you look at the entire thing, he is presenting a picture to you. That picture but say if you see, you may not form an opinion of any particular person. But once the author says something about, you presume three things. One, he was there. Two, he knows both these persons. And you tend to believe what he says is correct. Because he is taking the responsibility of making you believe that what I am saying here, reporting here is correct. Which may be correct, may not be correct. So if any one of these statements or any of the statements made by the author of that article does not fit into the facts of a case, then that publication house and its author is liable for damages. Because he has asked you for your faith and belief and he has said something to the public which is not correct. So that is publication of photograph with false captions. That comes under that head. Then this is a very debated topic whether there can be defamation between husband and wife. If you look at the instances of uh, old law, they have gone on to avoid saying that there can be cases of defamation between husband and wife because under the general clauses act they are one and the same. But now, of late, the law is slowly changing. Now, every man has this right first before being a husband or a wife. So if you are a citizen of India, then whether you are a husband or a wife, you have a right. I'm not going to show you anything.
when they be husband or a wife, this right comes first. Then, uh, if it's a publication, in fact, it's a defamation justification. And uh, this is all about publication. The other thing of publication is success in publication. This is something which you need to be very about. And who are liable for it? A event occurs today. I will give you one event what has happened. There was an officer, I am not taking any names, don't ask for names. There was a very highly decorated officer in IAS. She was attending a function where the Chief Minister of the State was present. And the Chief Minister of the State was to be honored by this IS officer. When she went to the stage, he was garlanded. He didn't look up to the IS officer. He was reading a paper. Something he was reading. So he stood up, took the honor, sat down. He didn't even be looking at the paper. And <coughs> the next day the papers came out that she is, she has been ignored. She does not fall into the right, uh, <coughs> right light, or she is in, not in the proper light of the uh, chief minister. That's why she, she was ignored. <coughs> some say that this has some connection with some event that had happened in the past, and the chief minister was aware of it. That's why she was not happy with this IAS officer being in his team, and all this story went on. The first person who reported it <coughs> is the person who presented the video which shows a lady walking up the stage, garlanding the chief minister and coming back. Nothing more, nothing less. If you just see the video without seeing the comment, you will find that's a natural thing. I go up like sir came today, gave me my honours and walked out. But the person who was behind this, he had an ill motive. He started writing all these things. That this officer had a bad history, chief minister ignored him, did not acknowledge him. So that was the first incessance. Thereafter, it so happened that other news articles started coming out of this incident. And all of them were portraying the first incident as reported and saying that it has been reported there. It has been reported by such and such media house that this has happened and this, 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 then they go on with their own comments. Now the question is, it's getting repeated time and again. Every time it is repeated, it gives a cause of action to somebody to sue them for defamation. Because this is an irresponsible statement made by the author of his own views. Because the video doesn't have any dialogue. So it's merely a gesture that remained a gesture. If at all anybody can say anything about that incident is either the two persons, either the chief minister or the lady. But none of them were there on the media, but people were discussing this. So there comes the question, the first person who reported this video clip along with his comments comes within the definition of a picture with a false caption or a false. The persons who are following it, they are just repeating the same incident, meaning thereby they are owning the statements made in that uh, first uh, report to be correct. And thereafter they are giving their views. 
So just because somebody else has said it and I am also saying it does not give you a defense to say that well I am not liable for it. I think Wally was not the first one to say it or I didn't say it originally. He said it, I just repeated it. That is also successive publication is also no defense. And in successive publication you will find that there is a inbuilt uh, what should I say? Inbuilt, uh, inbuilt uh, evidence of malice. You will always find it there. Because the second person who is reporting it cannot, will not do so, or may not do so, or will not do so in a negligent manner, in a mechanical manner, which are none of the differences unless he knows or is doing it with purpose and malice. It may be instigated by the first one. The first newspaper may have instigated the successive publication in other papers, having broader circulation. So there comes the concept of malice in defamation. That you are doing it with intent and purpose. And motive. So therefore, the next question that will follow is who is liable in such a case? Are they all or the first one? Or has to be. They are all joint tort feasors, which we call in law joint tort feasors. And if you read 499 now, which is our next segment, all of them have a motive. May not be the same motive, but the goal is the same. All of them have a motive. Now, sir, if I go to the next topic, which is, oh, no, no, before that I need to just finish this off. Now the question is, we were up till now, we were what is defamation, what can be defamation, what are the instances of defamation. Now, I thought it proper, I may be entirely wrong. And uh, I am venturing into this topic, being very candid, that what I am saying is, well, my perception of it, because I could not ascertain nor could I get help from any of the authorities what it should be. It's a question of quantification. That is something which I could understand is entirely within the discretion of the court. The reason why I say so is, well, before the court, the plaintiff puts his case, the defendant puts his case, the evidence is over, and the court comes to a conclusion that there is defamation. Now what? Because the court is only concerned with one thing, whether the plaintiff is entitled to the prayers he has made in this petition. And for that, that is where the reasoning comes of the court and that is where the justification has to be made. So far as damages is concerned, law as damages is governed by 73-74 of the contract. Beyond that, there is no law in India which governs damages and it covers the entire thing. <coughs> but in English law, you have, since it's uncodified, you have various heads of damages. But in England, but in India, it's 7374. Now, so far as general damages are concerned, these are some of the issues which you might take note of. Law presumes to be the natural and probable consequence. of the defendant's words of conduct. This is what I said first. If in civil law, damage is presumed. Law presumes to be the natural and probable consequence of defendant's 
words of conduct. If the words proved are defamatory of the plaintiff, general damages will always fall. This is so far as general damage is concerned. If over and above that, the plaintiff wants additional damages, that is what we call special damages. Special damages, in case of special damages, the onus remains with the plaintiff. They are damages of such that the law will not infer from the nature of the words themselves. So, if it is general, there is a basic presumption that your reputation is hurt. This is a general law. But if the plaintiff wants more over and above that, then the burden remains with the plaintiff to prove there is no presumption in his favor now. He must specifically plead and lead evidence of such situations which give his right to claim special damages. For example, if I may just share an example with you, suppose uh, somebody is in the process of getting a promotion from X to Y. Now, it can be two stages. One, you will get promotion in usual course or promotion was at your doorstep. You had received that offered letter. If at that point of time, that man or Remember whoever, that gentleman or individual is being offended and is being defamed and his reputation is in jeopardy. Obviously, general damages as a member of the society will fall. But if she wants to come to court and say, if or he, he or she comes to court and say, that look, because of this defamatory article, the government has delayed postponed or nullified my promotion just because of this article which is defamatory and for that my apart from my reputation being damaged there has been a loss of income loss of face loss of opportunity to go higher higher up like we very often come across uh, government officials who, or servants who say Sir, please don't do this. There will be some adverse remark in my service book. Now the incident for which this adverse remark is there, if he can prove that, that, that he has a causal connection with that defamation, then this is his case for special damage. So he has to plead it, provide evidence and prove it before the court that Apart from the general presumption of a of loss of reputation in the eye of the right thinking people, he has suffered more. That is special damages. Now, the question is how to assess. This is something, my lords, which you will have to take upon. I can give you the background, but as I find None of the authorities have or could have laid down. When we don't know what the law is, we say it depends on facts of the circumstances of the case. Because we are not sure. We don't want to set a straight jacket formula. Now, by compiling all the authorities, what I could gather, and this is probably what uh, is bothering me, is damages awarded in respect of vindication and injury to reputation and feelings depend on these following factors. And these factors I have gathered from various authorities. One is the gravity of the allegation.
Two is the size and influence of the circulation and publication. Three is the effect of the publication or circulation or publication. Let's take it up. Four is the extent and nature of the claimant's reputation or the plaintiff's reputation. And the conduct, fifth is the conduct and behavior of the parties. So, these are the five things which the court has to take into consideration or you my lord will have to take into consideration while deciding on the question of damages. Now, that's not the question which I was on. The question is, what should be the quantum? My reputation in Calcutta, if I am defending Calcutta, would be much more than if I am defending Sir. Because nobody knows me, sir. So the loss that I may suffer in my reputation would be less than what I have. So, but the question that is still boggling me is how much? How much? Because to her, I may be worth 5 rupees. To him, I may be worth 50 rupees. To you, maybe I am worth 50 lakhs. But having said that, I think, and this is, I repeat, I think, that it's not only the plaintiff's reputation that is the consideration. The consideration is what is the nature of the word spoken? Does it fit into the character of that man? Or has the defendant done so with an intention to malign? Because if the intention is to malign and purposely malign, then the scale of damages will go up. So, that would be the measure of damages depending on these five circumstances which the court will have to consider in a given case as to what should be the quantum. But it has nothing to do with the earning capacity of that man. A school teacher may have a very nominal salary but his reputation may be 50 times more. So, we don't look at him as to what his earning capacity is or where he stands in the society, as to how people recognize him in the society. And in these cases, teachers and all, they have a much higher reputation than politicians. So, this is all that I had to say from civil litigation on defamation starting from first to last. Uh, now, I am open to any queries if, if I can. It's not that I know everything. As I told I am a student of law. So, <coughs> we keep learning. If I can, if you have anybody has any queries, please shoot. Anything, ma'am? If 
proceed to the next topic. Next topic is not within my domain. It's criminal law. Uh, can we have 419 and 500 on the screen? By the way, we have a third topic, test of defamatory statement rules and principles. Do we need to okay, Yes, we already discussed that. That's what I was saying to but that most of the topics are so interconnected. Yes, interconnected. <coughs> Whoever, when I start on 499-500, I just need to remind that these two sections are the only codified law on defamation in India. There is no other codified law in India regarding defamation. Only these two sections are there and which have been subject matter of criticism for years together and now has almost been cornered as I, as I shall show you. Whoever by was, achha, by the way, one more thing, the cause of action for defamation in civil and criminal is the same. So the defamatory words would be the same. The persons would be the same. It's only that all acts have a civil as well as a criminal consequence. They can be both pursued together or depending on the choice. But a civil defamation, as I said that the law presumes damages to have occurred and there the tests are there. But so far as criminal defamation is concerned, the only difference is you will have to come within the four uh, sections and the ten explanations there are. If you don't come within this, you may have a cause of action for civil damages, but you may not have a cause of action for criminal defamation. So, on that basis, uh, whoever by words either spoken or intended to be read, can we see spoken is there. So, as I said, slander comes in. In India, there is no difference. Whoever either by word spoken or intended to be read, libel, <coughs> or by signs, it's covered in Indian law, or by visible representations, makes, makes is qualified spoken, signs, visible representations. So these three things are covered by makes or publishes is libel. Any imputation concerning any person, this imputation is an assertion concerning any person, there comes the motive and malice, intending to harm or knowing or having reason to believe that such imputation will harm. So malice comes intending to harm or knowing or having reason to believe that such imputation will harm. The reputation of the person is set in the cases hereinafter accepted to defend. So whatever this one and a half hours of civil defamation we talked about is just codified in these three lines.
So everything is in these three lines. Now there is an explanation to it. It may amount to deformation. This is over and above what is there. It may amount to deformation to impute anything to a diseased person. I was talking of uh, historical persons having reputation. It's a criminal. If it may amount to deformation to impute anything to a deceased person, if the imputation would harm the reputation of that person if he was living, and is intended to be hurtful to the feelings of his family or other near relatives. Now, I have one thing to say over here. Suppose, I sue sir, you please don't take it uh, in a true sense. Suppose I sir sue you for damages, for defending you. And during the continuance of the suit, I get a decree against you. You take it up in appeal. Before the appeal court, during the pendency of the appeal, I die as the plaintiff. Will the right to sue survive? That's one question. And the other question is, I sue you for damages. And before I get a decree, I die. There are two situations. One after the decree, one before the decree. In that case, whether my right to sue passes on to the near relatives and persons in In civil law, since order 22 has that word, is sui juris and having a right to sue. Because defamation is a private injury, mind you. It's not an injury to your property that passes. So, if you read Order 22, you will find that the first principles that we apply is whether the person who intends to be substituted in place of the deceased has a right to sue, or whether the right to sue in her name. If I die before I get a decree, in civil law, that action ends there. My son cannot say because he can't prove the defamation and the damage because it was my personal injury. In criminal, yes. But if I get a decree against you, that means the court has already adjudged that there has been you are liable for defamation. Therefore, he has the right to only protect. So there is a very subtle difference in when the right to sue passes on. If I sue you and before I can prove defamation, I die. In civil law, the action ends there. Because the right to sue that you have abused my father does not pass on to the son because the father could not prove. But if the father has proved it once, and you are trying to disprove it, he has the right to defend that. That is the civil law. So far as criminal law is concerned, it gives the right to the members of the family to also. So I can, if my, if you have defend my me, and I die, my son may sue you under 499. Don't take it, I'm just saying. Uh, because he may feel that the words that he used were intended to harm the reputation of his father and intended to harm the feelings of his mother, sister, whoever was in the family. So that is part of that deformation, it's extended. It may amount to deformation to make an imputation concerning a company. Who was asking about company and... Uh, she was asking, yes. Company or an association or collection of persons as such. We were discussing this. That if I make a general statement in civil law without impugning anybody, then law will not presume that there is any damage. But in criminal law, if you can show that it concerns a reputation of a company or an association of persons or a collection of persons, 
then you have an actionable action. Right? This is not there in civil law. Explanation 2 is not there in civil law. And an imputation in the form of an alternative or expressed identity may amount to defamation. X feels that, as I said, that example by innuendo. And why cannot conduct itself? So, this is an imputation in the form of an alternative. You are not saying something directly, but by your words, you mean something in the alternative where somebody is getting defamed. Expressed ironically may amount to defamation. So, all the three queries which I had received in today's city. They are all liable under the criminal law. Now, the fourth explanation is no imputation is said to harm a person's reputation unless one, the imputation directly or indirectly in the estimation of others, reputation, lowers the moral or intellectual character of that person or lowers the character of that person in respect of his caste or his calling or lowers the credit of that person or causes it to be believed that the body of that person is a loathsome state or in a state generally considered as disgraceful. All these things all these things are qualified that no imputation is said to harm a person's reputation unless the imputation is directly in the estimation of others. So all these three adjectives, lowering the moral character of a person, lowering the character of the person in respect of his caste, calling, we often say schedule caste, schedule try this, that, jamada, ramada, and all that stuff, lowers the petty credit of that person who in the estimation of others not in his estimation. This is the fourth pillar of your... So, you will find the entire gamut of civil law, the requirements of civil law are all there. All that we have been discussing right now. But the thing is, <coughs> now these examples are very important. A says, Z is an honest man. He never stole his watch. Intending it, cause it to be believed that Z did steal. This is in your head. B's watch. This is defamation unless it falls under any one of these examples. Any one of these examples, it was never circulated. People do not think of it. Whatever the exceptions are, I don't repeat myself. Now, Thara. A draws a picture of Z running away with B's watch, intending to believe that Z told B's watch. This is defamation unless it falls under any of the exceptions. And that's not important. Now, these are the exceptions. There are 10 exceptions to this rule. Imputation of truth with public good requires to be made and published. Fair comment. But this fair comment is qualified by two very important words which public good requires to be made or published. So it's not your views and fancies. Then, public conduct of public servants, privilege. Can you see it from there? We have, we have. Public conduct of public servants. Conduct of any person touching any public opinion. This is 19.1, Article 19.1 of the Constitution. I am not going into details because this is all there in the book. <coughs> then, publication of reports and proceedings of court, qualified privilege of court. Merits of the case decided in court or conduct of witness and other concern. That will come within the definition of qualified privilege. I think one of them was statements made by witness. One of them is qualified privilege is there. 
merits on public performance, what I am doing here. Censor passed in good faith by passing having lost the authority of another. That is the power he has under the statute. Uh, accusation preferred in good faith to authorized person. Now this good faith is something which is a very tricky thing. I think good faith is defined in the Indian penal code. Yes. 79 language has a good faith in the fact that. In section 2, good faith is a penalty section 2. Please assist me, madam, if you have if you have this again. 52. Yes. Nothing is said to be done or believed in good faith, which is done or believed without due care and attention. So, Kanya. Oh, no, Tika, you, you, you come back. You are faster than me. Uh, so, good faith would be those cases where as I said, intention is immaterial, but we have done so with a lot of care as it comes within the definition of section 52. Ado Gurajo, 10th exception. Caution intended for good of a person to whom conveyed for public good. You see, 499 has been using the word public good very often. Now, public good has a different meaning. Just give me a moment. I was reading. Public good means it is not defamatory to convey caution in good faith to one person is another provided the caution be intended for the good of the person to whom it is conveyed or of some person in whom person is interested or of public good. I think this, this example of uh, Adani is what is I meant by public good. But Madam and Sirs having said that uh, you need to consider the punishment I have not very uh, 5501. Everything follows thereafter till 502 is all that the law we have in, in India is of defamation. Now, what I intend to do is I don't want to repeat what would be criminal because it's all the same, whatever the summary. What I intend to show you is this 499 has been the subject matter of challenge. The wildness of this have been challenged before the Supreme Court. And this was probably the third challenge. Twice the Supreme Court had avoided a judgment on this, on the ground saying that this is not journey or this is not a right case where 499 should be considered. But a bunch of probably 36 or 42 petitions landed up 
where this bylaws was challenged and the Supreme Court has decided this. Now I need to show you, just to show that how far the court is giving importance to Article 19 vis a vis 499. Because if you are judging a question of, because as I understand, public, uh, private defamation is not much of importance. When it comes to freedom of speech and defamation, that is where the problem starts. As to how far a citizen's rights are being cut or whether he is being punished for a right which the constitution gives him. That is where the discussion probably would have some relevance. And I would like you to now share this judgment. The judgment of Subramanian Swami versus Union of Indri, Ministry of Law and Others. No, no, you have it in that drive. And thereafter, if you can come straight to paragraphs 168 and 169, I'm not going through the arguments. I'm just showing you. Can you see something? Yes, it's coming in. Because they can see it, obviously, because I'm coming in the way. No, sir, it's okay. Petitions which were filed has a history, although not in any remote past, but in the recent times. In this batch of writ petitions, we are required to dwell upon the constitutional validity of sections 499 and 500 of the Indian Penal Code and sections 199.1 and 199.4 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973. It is necessary to hear that these writ petitions have been taken up together and this is, this is all that was an issue before the court. Now if you come to paragraph 168, of freedom, this is what the code act. Anatomy of the provisions of the field in operation. Thora, thora. 167 can be read. If I may read it, having dealt with this facet, now we shall focus on whether sections 499 either in the substantive sense or procedurally violates the concept of reasonable restrictions, which is under that Article 19. We have to examine whether it is vague, arbitrary or disproportionate. For the aforesaid purpose, it is imperative to analyze in detail what constitutes the offense of defamation as provided under Article 499. To constitute the offense, there has to be an imputation and it must have been made in the manner as provided in the provisions with the intention of causing harm or having reason to believe that such imputation will harm the reputation of the person about whom it is made. Causing harm to the reputation of a person is the basis on which the offence is founded and mens rea is a condition precedent to constitute the said offence. This is in criminal law. The complainant has to show that the accused has intended or known or had reason to believe that the imputation made by him would hurt the reputation of the complainant. The criminal offence emphasizes on an intention or harm. Section 44 IPC defines injury. It denotes any harm whether illegally caused to any person in body, mind, reputation or property. Thus the word injury encapsulates harm caused to the reputation of any person. It also takes into account the harm caused to persons, body, mind and 499 provides for harm caused to reputation of a person that is complaint. So this is the basic thing. Now come to the explanation. Paragraph 170. You can skip section 169, that's the view of uh, 
the two main judge of our high court. Having dwelt upon the ingredients, it is necessary to appreciate the explanations appropriately. There are four explanations to the main provision. And an explanation has been appended to the fourth exception. Explanation four needs to be explained first. It is because the said explanation provides that expanse and the inherent control wherein what imputation has been regarded as harm to a man's reputation and that an imputation can only be treated as a harm of a person's reputation if it is directly or indirectly in the estimation of others lowers the moral or intellectual character of that person or lowers the character of that person in respect of his caste or his calling or lowers the credit of that person or causes it to be believed that the body of that person is a loathsome state or in a state generally considered as disgraceful. It is submitted by Dr. Dawal and its senior counsel that explanation 4 has the distinction and covers a number of criteria which can be used widely. He has commenced up as to a passage through state of Jammu and Kashmir versus Trilok Nath Khosla solely for the purpose that explanation 4 engulfs micro distinctions which is impermissible. Please read these lines with the view that the 499 and 500 is under challenge. So we are trying to dig holes into this, uh, uh, this uh, legislation. So he says that these def micro distinctions are impermissible. To appreciate manifold submissions urged by the learned counsel for the petitioners, it is seemingly to refer to how these explanations have been understood by the court. We are conscious that we are dealing with constitutional validity of the provision and the decisions relate to interpretation. But the purpose is to appreciate how the explanations have been understood by this court. This is where it will be of the explanations have been explained here. 171, if you can make a note, uh, 171, paragraph 171 to 174. Explanation 1 stipulates that an imputation would amount to defamation if it is done to a deceased person. If the imputation would harm the reputation of that person, if he is living and intended to be harmful to the feelings of his family or other near relatives. It is submitted by the learned counsel for the petitioner that the width of the explanation is absolutely excessive and it enables the family members to prosecute a criminal action whereas they are devoured to initiate civil action for damages. Please note the distinction. According to the learned counsel for the petitioners, explanation 1 is anonymous and, crea and creates a pipe situation which can effortlessly be called unreasonable. For when a civil suit cannot be entertained or allowed to be prosecuted by the legal heirs or the legal representatives, how could they prosecute criminal offence by filing a complaint? On a first blush, the aforesaid submission looks quite attractive, but on a keener scrutiny, it loses its significance. The reason is given here now. In Melipura Sakuni Esatam vs. Tengli Kalavati Nair, a suit for damages was dismissed by the trial court, but on appeal being preferred, the same was allowed. In second appeal, the High Court reversed the decree of the appellate court and dismissed the cross objection of the respondent therein. The appellant preferred an appeal by special leave before this court, and during the pendency before this court, he died. This was the example which I was trying to give. I was not that intelligent to make it, but I borrowed it from you. Anyway, he died. His surviving legal heirs came to be brought on record to prosecute the appeal. The issue that arose before this court was whether the appeal court should abate. The court posed the question whether in a defamation action the right to sue survives if the plaintiff dies. The court referred to a common law principle and the maxim actio personalis is monitor cum persona. A personal action dies with the person. And thereafter referred to section 306 of the Succession Act to which, as to which causes 
uh, uh, of action survive and which shall abate. The court in that context of why, when a suit for defamation is dismissed and the plaintiff has filed an appeal, what the appellate plaintiff is seeking to enforce in appeal is the right to sue for damages for defamation. And as this right does not survive his death, his legal representatives have no right to be brought on record of the appeal in his place and state if the appellate dies during the pendency of the appeal. The position, however, is different where the suit for defamation has resulted a decree in favor of the plaintiff. Because in such a case, the cause of action has merged in the decree. And the decretal date forms the part of his estate. And the appeal from the decree by the defendant becomes a question of benefit or detriment to the estate of the respondent. Plaintiff, which is legal representative, is entitled to uphold and defend and is therefore entitled to substitute it in place and place of the decision. This is, sir, what I was trying to say. So, thereafter, this uh, uh, in Mirapa so and so, two judges' bench distinguish the authority, the maxim so and so, then kindly come to 174. The aforesaid enunciation of law makes it clear. Let me finish it. Let me get some time. The law makes it clear how and when the civil action is not maintainable by legal heirs. The prosecution, as envisaged in explanation 1, lays two postulates. That is, the imputation to a deceased person is of such a nature that would have harmed the reputation of that person if he was living. And the imputation must be intended to do harmful to the feelings of the family or the other relatives. Unless the twin tests are satisfied, the complaint would not be entertained under section 199 CRPC. The explanation protects the reputation of the family or relatives. This is even another facet of defamation in criminal law. The entitlement to damages for personal injury is in a different sphere where a criminal complaint to be filed by the family members or other relatives under twin test being satisfied is in a distinct compartment. Please understand this. If I am saying I have been redistributed, civil action is my personal right. But the right given under explanation one, what the Supreme Court says, is not the right only of the person defended. That right percolates to the members of the family as well. So therefore, if I, if I may repeat, that if the twin tests given in the explanation are fulfilled, the prosecution has envisaged these two postulates. Imputation to a deceased person is to his nature that would harm the reputation of that person if he was living. And the same imputation must be intended to harm the feelings of the family as well. This aspect is not there when I sue for my defamation. But when it comes to the family members, they have that right. And that is what is the distinguishing feature between a civil action where I go to sue for my personal right, I die, the cause of action dies. But in criminal law, if the twin tests are, uh, are satisfied, then the family members of the deceased gets a continuing right to sue irrespective of the fact whether the person is dead or alive. So that is what has been clarified by the Supreme Court and which nullifies the logic given by Dr. Dhawan that if civil action is maintainable, uh, not maintainable, why does criminal action? So that was what that the Supreme Court has nullified. Um, it is more rigorous, the principle of grant of compensation and the principle of protection or reputation of family or near relatives cannot be equated. Therefore, we do not find any extra mileage is given to the legal heirs of a deceased person when they have been made eligible to initiate a criminal action by taking recourse to filing of a criminal complaint. This is what the Supreme Court has to say regarding explanation 1. I don't think I need to say anything more than what has been said. Now, similarly, you will find explanation 2. 
and all the 11 explanations, if you want to make a note of it, I have made a note of it, I don't want to hold you back. Paragraphs 171 to 174 is right of legal as. Paragraph 175 to 178 is explanation 2, which is right of a group or company. Does anybody want me to go with this? Because there are some questions regarding group companies' rights. Adam, you want me to read it? Because uh, this is what has been considered here. That's when I said that when I come to that aspect, I will... If you want, I can place these four paragraphs. If it doesn't hold you back. Just permit me. Explanation 2 deals with the imputation concerning a company or an association or collection of persons as such. Madam, your association of collection. Uh, explanation 3 says that an imputation in the form of an alternative or expressed ironically may amount to defamation. Section 11 IPC defines person to mean a company or an association or a collection of persons as such a body of persons whether incorporated or not. The inclusive nature of the definition indicates that juridical persons can come within this ambit. This is what I was saying. By virtue of that definition in the clause, it's not by general law. By virtue of the definition of the person being extended to juridical persons under the criminal law, that they come in under that exception of companies and group of companies. The submission that was, uh, uh, body of persons, yes. The inclusive nature of the definition indicates juridical persons can come within its ambit. The submission advanced on behalf of the petitioner is that collection of persons or for that matter association is absolutely vague. They are taking analogy from the civil law to strike down this section. That it's, it's, it's in general. This was the argument. Now that has been knocked down by the Supreme Court saying more than five decades back the court in Saib Singh Mehra was the state of UP while called upon to decide whether public prosecutor could constitute a class or come within the definition of collection of person referred to explanation 2 to section 499 and held that a collection of persons must be identifiable in the sense that one could with certainty say that this group of particular people have been defamed as distinguished from the rest of the community. This is the test. The court in the facts of the case held that the prosecuting staff of Aligarh or as a matter of fact the prosecuting staff in the state of Uttar Pradesh was certainly such an indefinite group or collection of persons and there was nothing indefinite about it. Thus the said authority emphasis laid on the concept of identifiability and definiteness as regards collection of persons. In Swanso vs. Swanso the court dealt with the applicability of the explanation as regards association or collection of persons and ruled that the collection of persons must be an identifiable body so that it is possible to say with definiteness that a group of particular persons as distinguished from the rest of the community was defamed. That's the test. Therefore, in case of explanation 2 is resorted to the identity of the company or the association or the collection of persons must be established so as to relatable to the defamatory words or imputations. So that connection has to be there. Where a writing weighs against mankind in general or against a particular order of men, for example, men of gown, it is no libel. It must descend to particulars and individuals to make it a libel. Thus, the accentuation is on particulars. In so and so, it has been proved that though the explanation is wide, yet in order to demonstrate the offense of defamation, such collection of persons must be an identifiable body so that it is possible to say with precision that a group of particular persons, as distinguished from the rest of the community, stood defamed. 
in case the identity of the collection of person is not established so as to be relatable to the defamatory words or imputations the complaint is not maintainable it has been further opined in this case a class is mentioned if such a class is indefinite the complaint cannot be entertained and furthermore it is not possible to ascertain the composition of such a class the criminal prosecution cannot be proceeded the aforesaid enunciation of law clearly lays stress on determinate and definite body it also lays accent on identifiable body and identity of collection of persons it is not significantly it also significantly states about the test of precision so that the collection of persons have a distinction thus it is fallacious to contend that it is totally vague and can by its inclusiveness cover an indefinite multitude the court has to understand the concept and opposites apply the same there is no ambiguity be it noted that the three judge bench though in a different context <coughs> in this case has ruled that a company has its own reputation be that as it may it cannot be that persons covered under expression are gloriously big now so far as the other explanations are concerned they are the exceptions have been discussed paragraphs 179 to 183 are on fair comment and this this is what i will be even if you don't want me to exceptions 2 and 9 good faith and public good Sir, please come to Paragraphs one eighty three to one eighty six. One eighty three. In Orunduti Roy, this is a very famous case. Orunduti Roy. This court, referring to the second exception, observed that every person. Claiming the benefit of the second exception to Section 499, that is good faith. I am telling in good faith, uh, or apology, whichever the Section 499 is required to show that the opinion expressed by him was in good faith, which related to the conduct of the public servant in the discharge of his public functions, or respecting his character. so far as his character appears in that conduct the third exception states about conduct of any person touching any public question and stipulates that it is not defamation to express in good faith any opinion whatever respecting the conduct of any person touching any public question and respecting his character so far as his character appears in this conduct the said exception uses the words good faith and particularizes conduct of any person relating to any public question and the exception as is perceptible gives stress on good faith the third exception comes into play when some defamatory remark is made in good faith as held in chaib singh mera the court has clarified that if defamatory remarks are made after due care and attention it will be regarded as made in good faith and in other words if the court has clarified that if defamatory remarks are made after due care and attention that is leading towards justification then when well, it will be regarded as made in good faith in the said case the court also adverted to the ninth exception which gives protection to imputation made in good faith 
the ninth exception to the IPC and to suffer 99. For the protection of the interest of the person making it or of any other person for the public good. A three judge one in Harvajan Singh Vasanso has opined that the accused involves the that the accused invokes the ninth exception to section 499. Good faith and public good are both to be satisfied, and the failure of the appellant to prove good faith would exclude the application of the ninth exception in favor of the accused, even if requirement of public good is satisfied. So if you don't have good faith, Public good defense is no good. The court has referred to section 52 which defines good faith that requires the element of honesty. It is necessary to note that the three judge bench has drawn a distinction between first exception and the ninth exception to opine that the proof of truth which is one of the ingredients of first exception is not an ingredient of the ninth section, exception and the ninth exception requires an accused person to prove is what he made the statement in good faith. Proceeding further, the court has stated that in dealing with the claim of accused under the ninth exception, it is not necessary and in a way immaterial to consider whether he has strictly proved in so and so. That is not very relevant. Then the concluding words, paragraphs 183 to 186, I said good faith and public good. Exception 5 is paragraphs 187 to 192. Now, I started off by saying that this was a case of defamation, uh, uh, challenging the virus of 499-500. Now, kindly see these three paragraphs which will give you an idea as to where defamation stands vis-a-vis -vis Article 19. Kindly take, uh, bring on screen paragraphs 193 to 196. This is what the Supreme Court is saying. Recently, the Constitution Bench in Modern Dental College was essential explaining the doctrine of proportionality has emphasized that when the court is called upon to decide whether a statutory provision or a rule amounts to unreasonable restrictions, the exercise that is required to be undertaken is, kindly mark, the balancing of the fundamental rights on the one hand and the restrictions imposed on the other. This is what is the state of law in India today. You have to balance them. It's not that one overrides the other. No. The emphasis is on recognition of affirmative constitutional rights. So constitutional right is getting a privilege. The emphasis is on the recognition of affirmative constitutional rights along with its limitations. Limitations means Article 19, Subsection 2, where those exceptions are given. Limitations save certain interests and especially public or social interests. Social interest takes in its sweep to confer protection to right of others to have social harmony founded on social values. To treat a restriction constitutionally permissible, it is necessary to scrutinize whether the restriction or imposition or limitation is excessive or not. The proportionality doctrine recognizing recognizes the balance of competing rights and the said hypothesis gains validity if it subserves the purpose it is meant for. Needless to emphasize that when a law limits a constitutional right, which many laws do, such limitation is unconstitutional if it is proportional is constitutional if it is proportional. The law imposing restriction is proportional if it is made to achieve a proper purpose and if the measures taken to achieve such a purpose are rationally connected to the purpose and such measures are necessary. Such limitations would not be arbitrary 
or of an excessive nature beyond what is required in the interest of public. Reasonableness is judged with reference to the objective which the legislation seeks to achieve and not in excess of the objectives. Then there is a lot of theory discussed which I need not trouble you. Kindly come to 195. One cannot be unmindful that the right to freedom of speech, this is very important paradigm. One cannot be unmindful that the right to freedom of speech and expression is a highly valued and cherished right. But the constitution conceives of reasonable restriction. In that context, criminal definition which is in existence in the form of 499 and 500 is not a restriction on free speech that can be characterized as disproportionate. Right to free speech cannot mean that a citizen can defame the other. Protection of reputation is a fundamental right. Can you see? This is the first time the Supreme Court is saying it's a fundamental right. So Article 21 is where it comes in. Protection of reputation is a fundamental right. It is also a human right. Cumulatively, it serves the social interest. Thus, we are unable to accept that provisions relating to criminal defamation are not saved by the doctrine of proportionality because it determines a limit which is not impermissible within the criteria of reasonable restrictions. <coughs> so, therefore, 199 and 500 was said to be constitutionally valid. But in doing so, the Supreme Court had very consciously said that, look, now if you could share the Constitution also, Article 19. But look, when you do this, please keep in mind that the Constitution gives every citizen a right of free speech. So, everything Protection to freedom of speech is everything except if you don't come on the 19. And under 192, you have defamation. And defamation is for 99500. That's the only law. So anything which does not come within 499 and 500 within the four corners may not be defamation under criminal law. Will not be. <laughs> Should we stop here for the yes, yes. They are interconnected with each other. If you look at the last topic, impact of Article 19, 1A and 2, they are of under the Constitution on Sections 499 to 502. That's the last topic of the day. That is, I need not make any lecture because that is exactly what we were discussing just prior to uh, the. Uh, lunch, pre-lunch session. And since the wiries of these two sections were under challenge and upheld, uh, negated by the Supreme Court, so all the discussion that is there on the scope of 191A, these are before 199, are on those sections. So this is squarely covered uh, by that judgment, which is, I believe, as of now, the latest position in law so far as India is concerned. So far as law and cyber defamation in India is concerned, you will find that uh, so far as the books that are available on defamation in the market today, they don't speak of uh, cyber defamation. They always speak of defamation that we knew prior to this uh, cyber world was introduced. And therefore they talk of print media, publication, personal uh, uh, acquisitions with tantamounting to defamation and the defenses. Now this cyber law, when it was introduced, it had to be, there had to be checks and balances because they were actually intruding into the rights of the people under the constitution. And one of the rights was right to privacy. People's personal thoughts, processes which they share were getting <coughs> in the media when they didn't intend to have it shared. That was one aspect. And the other aspect is which man you were just mentioning, forwarding messages. 
sending messages from one to other regarding a third party without any intention to do it. Now, if you look at section 66A, this is where it is. Punishment for sending, this is 66A of the Information and Technology Act of 2000. Punishment for sending offensive messages through communication service, etc. Any person who sends by means of a computer resource or a communication device, which means your phone also, any information that is grossly offensive or has a menacing character or any information which he knows to be false. How will they follow? It's okay, sir. We can see. You can even take this book if you need. But how will they follow it? Can you see? Any information that is grossly offensive or has menacing character or any information which he knows to be false but for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, insult, injury, criminal intimidation, enmity, hatred or ill will persistently by making use of such computer resource or a communication device any electronic mail or electronic mail message for the purpose of causing annoyance or inconvenience or to deceive or to mislead the addressee or the recipient about the origin of such messages shall be punishable with imprisonment which may extend to three years and with fine. This is the law that was there introduced by the Information and Technology Act. The punishment was, explanation is for the purpose of this section Electronic mail and electronic mail message means a message or information created, transmitted, received on a computer, computer system, computer resource, communication device, including attachments in text, image, audio, video and any other electronic record which may be transmitted with the message. The law that was intended to be established is if you are trying to successively repeat a message which is defamatory, if you are created either by say and you send it across, which is a speedier mode and a more convenient way of transmitting, the basic word is publish, then there is a chance that you may cause harm to the reputation of a man. Now, as I have already shown to you, reputation of a man has been held to be a fundamental right now because it's part of article 21 so therefore this is what the section intended to be and this is the law that was there till such time this law was challenged by this before the supreme court it was challenged on the ground that this law eats into the right of a particular citizen to have freedom of speech and in this judgment which was reported in 2015 and you will find in that book that reference is there 2015 volume 5 SCC the Supreme Court has struck down this section this is the judgment of Shreya Singhal versus Union of India reported in 2015 volume 5 SCC page 1 No, not that one 2015 It should be under the heading, just give me the moment Let me see what the heading is It would be Cyber Law, Defamation and IT Act Now 
since the supreme court has dealt with this issue instead of me giving my view because this is the view of the apex court if i can just enlighten with you some of the paragraphs which would probably assist us in understanding why this has been struck down if you come to page 3 of this yes page 3 may just share the preamble of the constitution of india kindly note one thing that whatever development in law that we are seeing everything is tested against article 90 and you will find that as the law progresses there is another judgment where section 79 has also been struck down by the supreme court that the supreme court is constantly saying that the basic structure of the constitution which an article 19 1a can only be touched by any law which does not infringe that 19 if you hit by any one of the provisions under 19 2 then that's bad <coughs> now the same principles this law was tested by the supreme court and this is what the courts had discussed if you see the first paragraph of that which is in paragraph 8 and 10 the summary of which is given here the preamble of the constitution of india interiorly speaks of liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship it also says that india is a sovereign democratic republic when it comes to democracy <coughs> liberty of thought and expression is a cardinal value that is of paramount significance under our constitutional scheme the importance of freedom of speech and expression both from point of view of liberty of the individual and from the point of view of the democratic form of government has been recognized by the supreme court in various judgments freedom of speech and expression of opinion is paramount importance under democratic constitution which envisages change in the composition of legislatures and governments and must be preserved it lies at the foundation of all democratic organizations public criticism is essential for the working of its institutions this right requires the free flow of opinions and ideas essential to sustain the collective life of citizenry while an armed informed citizenry is a precondition for meaningful governance the culture of open dialogue is generally of a great social importance the ultimate truth evolved by free trade ideas is competitive marketplace of ideas then this paragraph is very important if you want i can place the paragraph or i can take this this is a summary is very well done there are three concepts this is the test there are three concepts which is the fundamental in understanding the reach of freedom of speech and expression the most basic of human rights the first is discussion the second is advocacy and the third is insight mere discussion or even advocacy of a particular cause howsoever unpopular is at the heart of 191a so kind of see the shift from the old law to the new law this is the law that is emerging in india today and it says that mere discussions or even advocacy of a particular cause howsoever unpopular it is at the heart of is at the heart of 191 it is only when such discussion or advocacy reaches the level of incitement is it hit by 192 and incitement is one you will find the last word in that exception just after defamation and that article 192 just after defamation or incitement of speech is there so it is at this stage that the law may be made to curtail the speech or expression that leads in exorbitantly to or tends to cause public disorder or tends to cause or tends to affect the sovereignty and integrity of india the security of the state friendly relations with foreign state etc these concepts gain importance here most of the arguments of both the petitions and so 
Again, we are falling back on 19.2 and the words of 19. Now, so far as Information Technology Act is concerned, and so far as the 66A is concerned, kindly now share tab page 5. Section 66A of the IT Act 2000 casts the very wide all information that is disseminated over the internet is included within its reach. If you revisit that 66, everything and anything you do on the net is coming within that 66. The definition of information in 215 is an inclusive one. Further, the definition does not refer to what the constant of the information can be. In fact, it refers only to the medium through which such information is disseminated. Thus, the public's rights to know is directly affected by 66A of the IT Act of 2000. This is what the challenge was. Information of all kinds is roped in. Such information may have scientific, literary or artistic value. It may refer to current events, it may be obscene or salacious. That such information may cause annoyance or inconvenience to some is how the offence is made out. It is clear that the right of people to know the marketplace of ideas which the internet provides to persons of all kinds is what attracts 66A of the IT Act of 2000. That the information sent as only, uh, only be annoying, inconvenient, grossly offensive, etc. to address 66A also shows that no distinction is made between mere discussion or advocacy of a particular point of view which may be annoying or inconvenient or grossly offensive to some on the one hand and incitement by which such words lead to an imminent causal connection with public disorder. Disorderly security of the state, that is legal right of uh, legal, any of the eight subject matters enumerated under 19.2 of the constitution, or R66 of that, is creating an offense against persons who use the internet and annoy or cause inconvenience to others, very clearly affects the freedom of speech. An expression of the citizen of India at large. And in such speech or expression is directly caught by creation of an offence contained in 66A of the Act. So the Supreme Court is going to the extent of giving us the leverage to discuss advocate things over the internet. So long you don't say something which comes under any of the definitions of 192 of that of the Constitution. So as I keep repeating myself. The test today in India is 19.2 of the Constitution. This is the second instance we have come across where there has been a challenge to legislations which have got such right to free speech. One of them was 499.500 and the exception was very clearly drawn by that. The other is this 66A. Now, the other question which I would like to share with you just give me a moment, it's, a, it's such a long judgment that you will find if you see, just for the sake of discussing Share page paragraph 38. This was the view of Mr. Sergeant Nawala, senior advocate, 
and he has done a beautiful job of trying to show what 66 way was after because he was defending these sections. Thirty-eight, yes, yes. If you come to page thirty-eight, you will find the state in its effort to defence or defend this sixty-six A had made a list of the offences which can be covered under both the sections. Mobile phone lost, stolen, receiving stolen computer phone data such and such owned by you in the hands of someone else, data owned by you from the company. 66B up to 3 years imprisonment and then 379 under 411, 3 years of imprisonment. So, and if you go down, you will find that each one of the queries which you have, Madam, I, I, I don't have, I share the judgments, this entire folder is for you. There are a bunch of 7 or 9 judgments. I could only cite three or four because time permitting. You can take from there, you will find all this is there. So you will find that all the queries that you had regarding stealing of emails, sending of words, password stolen, these were all covered under 66A, 66B and C. This was what the legislature had proposed when the Information Technology Act had come into place. And thereafter, all of this, after the challenge, has gone. Permit me, just give me a minute. One thirty four. <coughs> I am just taking snippets from this judgment because this judgment runs up to probably 200 pages. Any of the eight subject matters contained in Article 19.2. We may incidentally mention that the state has claimed that the said section can be supported under the heads of public order, defamation, incitement to an offence and decency or morality. So the state was actually trying to go under the cover of 19.2 to protect this section 66A so that it's not struck off from the book. Under our constitutional scheme as stated earlier, it is not open to the state to curtail freedom of speech to promote the general public interest than, than uh, what has been cited. Some authority has been quoted. If you come to the next page, the last paragraph 25 the restriction made in the interest of public order have you got it the restriction made in the interest of public order must also have reasonable relation to the object to be achieved that is public order if the restriction has no proximate relationship to the achievement of public order it cannot be said that the restriction is a reasonable restriction within the meaning of the said clause the decision in our view lays down the correct test. The limitation imposed in the interests of public order to be a reasonable restriction should be one which has proximate connection or nexus with public order, but not one far-fetched, hypothetical or problematical or too remote in the chain of its relation. There is no proximate or even foreseeable connection between any instigation and the public order sought to be protected under this section. We cannot accept the argument of the learned advocate general that instigation of a single individual not to pay tax or dues is a spark which may in the long run 
ignite a revolutionary movement destroying public order. So disturbance to public order has been kept at that high a pedestal that it must lead to not some group of people trying to agitate something. You are circulating something which can or has the potential to escalate even a revolution of a national level or a rebel within within a state. That is what. When you are curbing something, you must keep in mind that it is only in those circumstances you have a right to curb the freedom of freedom of speech of a man. Not otherwise. If I go out on the street or if I go to a class and with the speech of mine I can uh, excite the whole bunch of 60 students in that class. That is my right of freedom of speech. Advocacy. That will not be a crime under the constitution or under any of the acts under 499 or 500 that I will be liable for. So this, this line that there is no proximate or even foreseeable connection between such instincts have sought to be protected under the section is what was the basis for striking down section 66 capital A. Because what was section 66 a capital A doing? He was trying to say that you have a very powerful media in your hand which is not controlled. Once I become a member of Facebook or Twitter or for that matter WhatsApp, whatever, you don't have control over it. The government cannot have control over it and does not have control over it. In fact, you will find that there were circulars going around that governor was the, the government of India was trying to have control over that. But that was discouraged, that no you cannot. Because that was affecting the right to privacy of a man. What I discussed with my friend regarding you, even if it concerns the affairs of the government of India, so long I am not discussing something which offences the sovereignty of the state, under 19.2 I have a right to discuss that. That is our democracy. And so therefore, apropos your question, that if I receive an objective material, I pass it on to somebody. Because I thought that it is worth passing it, or I do it in unintentionally, or I just want to share it with a friend. That's your right, which the constitution gives you. And the person who will be complaining against you will have to show that what you have circulated either comes under any one of the except, uh, explanations to uh, sections 499 and 500 of the IPC, or if he is suing you for defamation for circulating that under the civil law, then in that event, this is where you come. So long you are not hit by 19.2, he gives you that right. Now, kindly see, apropos your views, the reason why I brought it up is why the government was trying to curtail or introduce 66A. And all these, all these uh, uh, exceptions, which our additional solicitor general had argued, have all been negated by the Supreme Court. Please bring up section 30, paragraph 30 once. You will find that in all these exceptions, the intention of the government is to have control over the media. You see, it was argued by the learned advocate solicitor general Kajal, that relaxed standard or reasonableness of restriction should apply regard be had to the fact that the medium of speech which the internet differs from other mediums on several grounds. To appreciate the width and scope of his submission, we are setting out his written submissions in verbatim. This is what was there. The reach of preach media is restricted to one state or at the most one country while internet has no boundaries and its reach is global. The recipient of free speech and expression used in a print media can only be a literate person while internet can be accessed by illiterate and literate and illiterate both since one click is needed to download an objectionable post or a video. In case of television, serials except live shows and movies there is a permitted pre-censorship which ensures right of viewers not to receive any information which is dangerous to 
or in conformity with the social interest. While in the case of an internet, no such censorship, pre censorship is possible, and each individual is publisher, printer, producer, director, broadcaster of a content without any statutory regulation. In case of print media or medium or media or medium of television and films, whatever is truly recorded can only be published or broadcasted, televised and viewed. While in case of an internet, morphing of images, change of videos and many other technologically admitted methods to create serious potential social disorder can be applied. By the medium of internet, rumors having serious potential of creating a serious social disorder can be spread to trillions of people without any check, which is not possible in case of mediums. In case of mediums like print media, television and films, it is broadly not possible to invade privacy of unwilling persons. While in case of an internet, it is very easy to make upon the privacy of an individual and thereby violate <coughs> sorry, violating his right under Article 21 of the Constitution. By virtue of its very nature in the mediums like newspaper, magazine, televisions or a movie, it is not possible to sexually harass someone, outrage the modesty of anyone, use unacceptable filthy language and evoke communal frenzy, which can lead to serious social disorder. While in case of an internet, it is easily possible to do so by a mere click of a button without any geographical limitations and almost in all cases while ensuring anonymity of the offender. By the, manifold, by the very nature of the medium, the width and reach of internet is manifold as against newspaper and films. The same mediums have inbuilt limitations. Persons will have to buy, borrow a newspaper and are, will have to go to the theatre to watch a movie. For televisions also one needs to at least a room where a television is placed and can only watch those channels which are subscribed and that too only at the time when he is being telecast. While in case of an internet person abusing the internet can commit an offence at any place at a time of this choice and maintaining his anonymity in all cases. In case of other mediums it is possible to maintain anonymity as a result of speech, idea, opinion, films having serious potential creating social disorder. No, where did you go? Uh, yes, but maintain anonymity, disorder never gets generated since the original is bound to be known. While in cases of internet, mostly its abuse takes place under the garb of anonymity, which can be unveiled only after through investigation. In case of these are the arguments that were made by him, and you will find that all of our concerns today will fit in any one of these exceptions. Has to. But in spite of all these arguments being made, the Apex Court went on to say that we have two subsisting laws in our country. One is for 99500 and coupled with that there are exceptions under 192. If you don't come within this, you cannot make a law which will go and curtail the rights under 191. And that is the reason why you will find that this section 66A has been struck down by this judgment. So it has to be that high. Public order, uh, disorder, offending the sovereignty, affecting relationship with foreign states. You have to reach that high to curtail the freedom of a particular man. And that is the paradigm shift in the law of defamation that has taken place or is currently taking place in India now. Now there is defamation has also been discussed here. Any if anybody wants. find here that uh, in this judgment, uh, if you find time to go through it, you will find that all the aspects which uh, the Solicitor General has raised concern, that these are possible on the internet, each one of them have been dealt with in various paragraphs of this judgment, running from paragraph number 80 onwards. But 
there is one more thing which I need to show you before I go on to the next topic is this one. Kindly come to page 178. find that while discussing uh, on the uh, question of um, constitutional validity of 66 capital A, Supreme Court has referred to another section of the Information and Technology Act which is section 79. No. 178, page 178, yes, at the bottom after paragraph 160. Yes, section 79 of the Information Technology Act. Now permit me to place this section because this has also been a subject matter of challenge. And this section talks about a concept which has been introduced by the Information and Technology Act which is called an intermediate. Who is an intermediary? An intermediary is the person who is offering you the platform to share. Notwithstanding anything contained in any law for the time being in force, but subject to the provisions of subsection 2 and 3, an intermediary shall not be liable for any third party information data or communication link made available or hosted by him that means the platform the provisions of subsection wall shall apply if the function of the intermediary is limited to providing access to a communication system over which information made available by third parties is transmitted or temporarily stored or hosted or the intermediary does not initiate the transmission, select the receiver of the transmission and select or modify the information contained in the transmission. And the intermediary observes due diligence, highly mark the words, intermediary observes due diligence while discharging his duties under this act and also observes such other guidelines as the central government may prescribe in this behalf. Then thereafter, the provisions of subsection 1 shall not apply if the intermediary has conspired or abated or aided or induced, whether by threats or promise or otherwise, in the commission of the unlawful act. Upon receiving actual knowledge, or on being notified by the appropriate governments or its agency that any information, data or communication is link residing in or connected to a computer source controlled by the intermediary is being used to commit an unlawful act, the intermediary fails to expeditiously remove or disable access to material response without vitiating the evidence, then he will be liable. What I am trying to say is as of now, 66A was only restricted to the persons who are actually doing the act of transmitting, receiving, uh, circulating, defaming. They were the persons. Now, it has also been noticed that there is a third party involved in this cyber world, which are the platforms which allow you to circulate. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, WhatsApp and I, I am limited to only these four. There may be other platforms also. What are these people doing? 
I am defaming him. I am discussing him with you. How am I doing it? I am doing it over the phone. On WhatsApp. And that it reaches from me to you is through the intermediary. Now the question is, is the intermediary aware of the fact that what I am sending to you is defamatory or offense any one of those under 19 to? If so, is he liable? You will find, madam, when nowadays, whenever there is news, we nowadays don't read newspapers. We check the news either on the Facebook or on the Instagram or on Twitter or on the net. In whichever platform it is allowed to be hosted, the intermediary has a responsibility. What responsibility it has? It has a responsibility to make a due diligence. To find out whether the news that I am allowing to be transmitted or I am allowing to be circulated through me is proper or not. Whether that offends any man's right or not. Now there is a debate which I accrued that the intermediate is not possible because it reaches to trillions in minutes. It is not possible for an intermediary to find out. If X is saying something about Y through Z and Z is only the conduit by which the message is going, I am not concerned with the truthness of it. I am not concerned with the correctness of it. Thing is whether you would be allowed to do it or not. There, the Supreme Court has subsequently there was a challenge to say, section 79 and section 79 has been modified. Modified in what sense? A rule has come out which we generally say in uh, colloquial words take down. There is a grievance officer under the 2011 Act. Each intermediary has to maintain a grievance officer. The moment I find that there is something defamatory against me on any one of the platforms, the first thing I do is I inform the intermediary. That is what is written. Through the grievance officer asking him to take it down. But he won't take it down on my mere asking. If you block, if you check that take down message, if you go and click over there on the internet, you will find it comes with two options. Either you are logged out of that site, that the news remains, or you get an option that you will not receive any further news regarding you from that website. But the news remains. So there, if you have exercised your right calling upon him to take down and he doesn't take down, then you have a right to rope him in also in case of a defamation. Because you have put him on notice that this circulation which is going on on your website is not correct. You have not done your due diligence. Like previously when the net was not there, you will find in those judgments, there are a lot of judgments, where the editor was held responsible when the author was held responsible for defamation because of the simple reason they are the persons whose opinions were being used for the purpose of truth. Now that author or that editor has now become the Facebook or the Twitter or whichever made the platform. And he is not doing anything. Like the editor used to edit so that he doesn't be offend anybody. This, this platform doesn't do anything. It just passes on news from one to other. And that is where the Supreme Court had challenged and said that no, initially the law under section 79 was you are liable straight up. Then the Supreme Court said no. And this came out in the judgment of Google India. Google was the first one to challenge it. And this is, achha, before I do this, kindly come to paragraph 124 and let me finish this topic once. So the sum and substance of section 66, the fate of 66A which was under challenge is this. In conclusion, we may summarize what has been held by us above. Section 66A of the Information Technology Act is struck down in its entirety, being violating of Article 191A. 
and not saved under 19. This is the test again. Then 69A and the information technology safeguard for blocking to access information public through 2000 block are constitutionally valid. Section 79 is valid subject to 79.3b. This is what I was discussing. Section 79 is valid subsection to 3b. Being read down to me that the intermediary upon receiving actual knowledge from a court order or being notified by the appropriate government or his agency that unlawful acts relatable to 19.2 are going to be committed then fails to expeditiously remove or disable access to such material. Similarly, the information technology intermediary guidelines 211, this was the guidelines which I was talking of, are valid subject to rule 3 sub rule 4 being read down in the manner as indicated in the judgment. So, this is what the law is on Cyber India today. And now, the Google judgment. The reason why I am not saying anything because this is so much being discussed in judgments, every year you will find this law is changing. And what I am trying, attempting to do is give you the latest position. Uh, this Google India judgment is is 2020 volume 4 Supreme Court cases page 162 under the heading uh, Cyber Reformation Section 79 IT Act. see the nature of the complaint paragraph 2. Paragraph 2, the complaint, because we, yes, the complaint is a public limited company engaged in the business of manufacturing and selling asbestos cement sheets with seven manufacturing plants and more than 25 marketing offices all over India. It further internally stated that the product is manufactured in all its plants in an environment friendly manner. The first accused, which is Google, is alleged to be a coordinator of Ban Asbestos Limited, a group hosted by the Apple. Articles were regularly published in the group on 2011-2008. An article was published, it was captioned Poisoning the System in the Hindustan Times. The complaint targeted renowned politicians of the country who were named and who had nothing to do with the ownership and management of the company. The complainant pleads shock on seeing the article dated 31st July 2008 caption Vishaka Asbestos Industry Making Gains. It stated that asbestos shipments have been manufactured for more than 70 years in India. The first accused single out the complainant though there were other groups manufacturing the asbestos. The relevant part 
which is pertinent for the appellant is contained here. The complainant most humbly and respectfully submits that the accused number one statement in the article in the amendment group hosted by the accused number two is filled with hatred towards complainant which is defamatory in nature and which a person of ordinary intelligence in society would believe the said statement. Indeed, the said statement injured the reputation of the complainant. The act of the accused is posting certain defamatory articles in the cyberspace which is visited by innumerable internet surfaces, uh, surfers which has wide usage all over the world in whose mind the complaint company is being caused with such defamatory false statements. The service provider being the accused number two has made it easier than ever before to decimate defamatory statements to the worldwide audience without taking any due care and diligence to prevent it. Accused number two has abused the services provided by it because both the articles in the group hosted by it were targeted towards a public company which is well within the knowledge of the accused number two. This was the issue over there. And apropos this, the Supreme Court while taking section 79 into consideration came to this conclusion. Kindly come straight to the conclusion. Paragraph 52. Paragraph 52 at page 188. Yes, this is the amendment which I was talking about and this is probably the last thing I have to say. The 2008 amendment introduced by chapter 12 of the Information Technology Act, the amendment was in the background of the decision of Delhi High Court in such and such. Intermediaries stand on a different footing being only facilitators of exchanges of information or sales. Prior to the amendment, the exemption under 79 did not exist and therefore an intermediary would have been liable for any third party information or data made available by him as seen in Basel. After the amendment, the intermediary is not liable under, the, under any act if it satisfied the requirements of section 79. So this is what the law of cyber defamation today in India is. There were only two sections in the Information Technology Act one was 66A, which has been struck down. 79, at the same breath, held the intermediaries to be liable, which has been curtailed, and certain provisions have been introduced to give intermediaries a free hand if they do not come within any of the exceptions under section. So, so far as cyber law is concerned, what we keep on reading that if we pass on a news from X to Y, I am also liable. The police may come to my door and knock the door and say, Chalo, let's go. That's not the law in India. So, now if you can have a flashback as to what I said in the morning and what I'm saying in the afternoon, you will understand how the law has traveled from the days when you used to call a thief and land up in jail to the law today where you can discuss anything and everything so long you don't offend Article 19. This is the gamut of defamation in India today. Any more queries?